great, y'all. I'm just going to keep it real. That that lighted my heart up. That was funny as hell. That guy was acting like a fool. Yes. Extended magazine. Illegal. 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 And just have it there. Why you need it at work, though? What type of life you got to think about? Are they living out there? What's going on? There were some suggestions that they had a magic car ring in Dalton. But, you know, allegedly is alleged. But I know it's some underlying crooked stuff. If the police is crooked. But this is something nobody's talking about. So I'm glad that this content creator brought this out. So Mr. Lee brought this up in Dalton Media. When? Please tell me. Ms. Martin, Um, please tell me. And then we could pull it up. You know what I'm saying? On a future date. Yes, shout out to Mr. Lee. All right, so now we're about to start getting the broadcast moving. <clears throat> now to the people who have the patience and the brain capacity, this is going to be basically like a presentation. We're going to go over some key things that I have found in the University of Illinois Division of Public Safety uh, Policy Manual that uh, I want to share with you guys. Uh, looking into the police station, of Dalton, wondering how they behave, where they get their policy from. It kind of like put me in a path of saying, let's get down and dirty and figure this out. Is they actually um, lawful in what they do? Especially with the Alexis Wilson um, case, you know, there's some things that we wanted to highlight. I want to highlight, so, you know, see where these people get the audacity and the power to do this. So, <clears throat> I want to go into some of the training. So some of the training, this this right here is a, a handbook that I found, and I'm still requesting under the Freedom of Information request from the training board to make sure that this is the actual up-to-date and truest copy. But I do believe this is it. This is from the University of Illinois, Division of Public Safety, and this is the policy for um, Illinois Police Department. This is current at January 2024. So going into it, I want to go into policy 203. We're going to go into training just a little bit. We're going to skip through this, and then we're going to get into Miss um, Duke's case and Officer Mal's case. And then it is some reference that I have back to this actual manual that we can't reference back. I'm going to try to I'm not going to rush this, y'all. We're going to take our time, and I'm going to cut this up for y'all because it's going to be something that I think the Dalton residents need to know about and also the general public. So when you're doing your research for things that's going on around you, you'll at least be able to go through manuals and, you know, pay attention to some of the details as we go through this together. All right? So what page is this? 27. And please hit the like button. Yes, please hit the like and share, share, share. Sharon is Karen. We had to put in the work. All right, so hold on. Policy two or three. All right, policy two or three is training. So here on the policy right here. 203.2 policy, the department shall administer a training program that will meet the standards of federal, state, local, Illinois law enforcement training and standard board training requirements. It is a priority for the department to provide continued education and training for professionals, um, growth and development of its members. So continuing training coordinator. So this is the chief of police. Now, in the chief of police of each department, I would assume they're talking about. And if they're talking about chief of police and Lacey Lewis to do this, maybe we know why they happening. But it says the chief of police shall designate a training coordinator who is responsible for developing, reviewing, under, un, uh, updating, and maintaining the department training plan so that required training is completed. The training coordinator should review training planning annually. So these are some of the questions that I'm going to be asking the adults and police as far as some of the officers who were involved in some of these untimely deaths, okay? Now, I'm showing you this because if you ever have any questions, you want to make sure that your questions don't be linked to policy. You see what I'm trying to say? Well, according to policy 203.2, 
this is how it's supposed to be. Is this what your administration is doing? You see what I'm saying? This is what we get into. Um, 305, training plan. I want to highlight that. It's just a few things I want to go over. And then I want to highlight some things that I think should change. And then once I finish that, I want y'all to just get in the comments, put your comments there, y'all have questions, whatever y'all want to say. Y'all know I'm going to put it on the screen as soon as I get to it. That's what we do. Y'all care about what y'all say and what y'all thinking. That's why we're here. All right. So now it says training plan. It is the responsibility of the training coordinator to develop, review, update, and maintain training plan and to ensure that mandated basic in-service and development the required training is completed by all members as needed and required. The plan should include systematic and detailed method of reporting and logging in all training for all members. So this is some of the things that should be retrievable for you guys and y'all should have this for y'all particular your particular state as well now this is some of the things that i felt you know that i wanted to highlight that some of the things that i think something should change so right here under the training section it says officers must successfully complete a minimum basic enforcement training or similar approved training program within six months of full-time employment so one, first and foremost, they should not be able to be employed without finishing their training. This is a in red light to me, okay? This is why we're going through this corny shit. So y'all can know what governs the Illinois police out there and why they do what they do. Does that make sense? Officers, so they go on to say the basic training requirement may be waived if the employee is eligible for the certification by meeting training and Certification standards within the perimeters extension expectations set by. Now, I didn't go into this. I didn't look into this yet, y'all. So I'm going to look on what is the exception on a later date. But it was a lot of stuff that I was going to highlight here. So I'm just trying to really keep it to a minimal because I know my audience. <clears throat> I got to try to keep y'all enlightened, but I'm not going to. So when I, when I find out about what is their actual, what can make them excuse from this set, uh, I'll let y'all know. Now, moving forward, it says the state mandate test requirements every year. So every year, these officers are supposed to do this, okay? These are continued educations, just like what I have to do, continue educations as a nurse, you know? I'm here. I'm here, y'all. I'm here. I'm chilling, okay? See? Anyway, this is what I have to do as a nurse, continue educations, and every time I step into a facility. So yearly, the Illinois police are supposed to be updated on legal updates, emergency medical response training, crisis intervention, officers' wellness and mental health. One of the main things I want to highlight is officers' wellness and mental health. We're going to go into psychological evaluation and how I think that they need to be done more often. They also supposed to go into firearm re retraining, restraining order act. So this is something that I'm going to get into into another day, which is firearm restraining order act. So this is something that goes to be updated yearly. And also the use of force must include scenario-based or similar training in accordance to the ILETSD mandate. So you, us as citizens, me, you, me being an online Dalton resident, you want to know, you, we already know half your cops not passing the test, okay? But also these are other questions that you want to know. And when your new administration comes in, these are the details you want to highlight to make sure that these people are certified, that they are um, abiding by their continued education, and they are mentally stable, okay? So this is what they're supposed to do yearly. Now, this is what kind of made me feel a little bit away because I do think that they should do this yearly as well. But the state mandates training requirement every three years for the following. Constitutional and proper use of law enforcement authority. If you read, read most of the court, <clears throat> excuse me, the cases that we have read involving Dalton and Hendrick and her administration, and also Lacey Lewis, let's put his thick ass up there. You know, I'm gonna have to excite y'all, put some ugly faces up there. Let me put, let me put his thick ass up there. Him himself, some of the things that um, they said they should do every three years is learn about constitution and proper use of law enforcement authority. This should be every year, not every three years, okay? This is something that I think people should um, petition or fight to get changed, okay? Procedural justice, these are things that they have to go over every three years. This is shit that they need to go over every six months, especially people like him. Civil rights, human rights. 
mandatory child abuse reporting, culture conferences, mental health awareness and responsibility. This is um, continued education for them every three years, in which I think they should have this annually and upon needed. Okay? Training on sex, sexual assault and sexual abuse response and reporting. So those are one of the things that we may double back on when it comes to the Fania case. But it seems like, you know, when we listen to the case officer, we're going to get a more, more uh, a better background of what happened and offer some Mal's perspective too as well, okay? So also they said in, in three years they should uh, be approved to use force. They should look into approved use of force training, including policies and laws related to stop and search and officer safety techniques. They don't have to revisit this to every three years. This is something that needs to be revisited every year. And that should be included in um, what they had said before, the use of force and the live scenario-based um, simulation that they're requiring for the police. Does that make sense? Okay, tell me am I off, y'all. I know I go from cracking jokes and doing shit, but we're going to have to get real here because some of these things they're doing is dead wrong. So this is some of the things that I found um should be yearly and they close off a scenario based role playing six hours to de-escalate and six hours high risk traffic stop in accordance to the illinois etsd mandate okay and i think that should be every year because that's where you find a lot of falsies happening between the police and the general public through tra general tra traffic stops you already said you saw the 33 point $5 million case caused by this dick bucket, excuse my language, you know, I had to drop one, and his fellow officer pursued a case, a chase, and it even goes to police, police chase in this manual, you know, and they were totally out of pocket when I read that. So let me see what else I want to show you. Who is the child? Okay, I know, okay, domestic violence, that's yearly. So they posted going to domestic violence yearly. So Jim, what else I wanted to show you? Okay, all right, so we move off from that section, and I want to, I think it's something else I want to show you. Totality of circumstances. Now, this is some of the things that I want you guys to pay attention to, because when y'all hear it, you're not going to understand why these officers behave the way they behave, because they have a certain perspective, okay? Um, now, this is going to go into policy 300. Okay, we're going to scroll on down. Please hit the like button and the share button if you're getting this work tonight. You know, basically about to switch it up. We could be cracking jokes one day and come back heavy the next day. We're going to break this live up for everyone so you guys can get this information and share it with adults and residents as well as yourself because you can use this as an example to learn where to get your information and how to disseminate it. That's one thing that I'm good with, learning. I'm good with learning and, and breaking down hard information and making it very simple. So that's why I think that I am a point role to the Dalton movement. That's why I'm your online resident. We all play a part. Now, this goes into policy 300, goes into use of force. So here we'll give you an idea of kind of like the perspective of the police in Illinois, because this is directly related to Illinois. So it goes into the meaning of deadly force, feasible, and that's a reasonable capability of being done or carried out under circumstances to successfully achieve the arrest and lawful object objective without increasing the risk to the officer or another person. Now, I will say that these policies does highlight that, that they want the officer to mitigate the risk, the risk factor between the general public and themselves. And some of them really say you're not supposed to pursue, you're supposed to stop. And it seems like these officers don't know this. So um, totality of circumstances, all facts and circumstances known to the officers at the time, taking a whole, included, taken as as a whole, including the conduct of the officer and the subject leading up to the use of force. So just keep in mind as well, because when I was reading into like when officers have to tell, sometimes what stopped them is basically the other officer would say you don't know the whole situation 
like it's other things that you don't that maybe you don't know about that made me act this way so officers act under that guise and that's the underlying tone and that's why some things are not reported does that make sense so this goes into policy the use of force by law enforcement personnel in the matter of critical critical concern both to the public and the law enforcement community officers are involved on a daily basis in numerous various interactions and when warranted may use reasonable force in carrying out their duty listen these are the mindset this is what's behind them also must have an understanding of the true apprehension for their authority and limitation and this is what i think they're not considering they understand their authority but they don't understand their limitation this is especially true with respect to overcoming resistance while engaging in performing a law enforcement duty the department recognizes and respects the values of all human life and i'm gonna say allegedly no disrespect police and dignity without prejudice to anyone vesting officers with the authority to use reasonable force and to protect the public welfare requires monitoring evaluation and a careful balance of all interests this is the foundations of their policy so when i ask some questions this is the shit i'm gonna pull up i'm gonna like what copy and paste according to policy 342 page this is this is this this is how you start Put your stuff together, y'all, when y'all want to present, you know, y'all grievances. Um, okay, duty of interceding and reporting. Now, this is talking about the officers who are on the outside. So I have to send some, you know, love and blessings to some of the officers that's going through distress. As time go on, I'm going to be talking about the other side of this game as well. We do have officers that are under distress. Um, and i uh, I will be sharing some of their stories with you guys, okay? We got a few secret sparrows all around, okay? And they, they're talking too. They're going through the stress. So shout out to the officers who actually have a heart and care and they're being thrown around and they see things that they can't report or they try to report and then they were treated like Officer Miles. What we're going to get into is his name is Miles. Let me make sure my ass. Oh, yes. Okay, I said it right. Okay, so duty to intercede and report. An officer present and observe another law enforcement officer or member using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable. Now, I keep saying reasonable. Now, this is what you guys need to understand about law. Law is based on reasonable um, circumstances that will highlight the general public's perspective or the general science, society or culture like for instance it's not really feasible for you to go up to somebody and just smack them that's not part of our culture norm but let's say like in a cartoon is a, a country like that that does that so in their particular court they wouldn't find that as a problem because smacking people is a culture norm so based on object objectively reasonable under their law and circumstances that may not be a crime. You see how law is adjustable and you see how law is not under God. It's just how it's applied, depending on where it's at. Let me just shut up. Let me move forward. Anyway, because God law is solid. You behave like this everywhere. Okay. Anyway, you know I gotta bring God in the game. Hold on one second, y'all. Give me one second. Let me drink some tea. All right. So let's keep it going. Now we're going to go into the duty of the officers. These officers that must tell allegedly officers or a member using force that is clearly beyond that which is objectively reasonable under the circumstances shall, when in the position to do so, intercede to prevent the use of reason, unreasonable force. Okay. Any officer who observes another law enforcement officer or a member use force that is potentially beyond that which is objectively reasonable remember that under the circumstances should report these ob observations to supervisor as soon as feasible office shall submit a written report directly to the deputy chief within five days this is what they're supposed to do and this is what's hard for them to do perspective listen to this dun, dun, dun. when observing or reporting force used by law enforcement office each officer should take 
into account that totality of circumstances and possibility that other law enforcement officers may have additional information regarding the threat posed by the subject. That's why officers become standoffish because that is in their handbook. That's a law that, hey, even though you post to tell, you better make sure that you know that you know the totality or shut the hell up, allegedly. That's what I read from this. Okay. Yeah, that was that must have been an amendment added on. I wonder when that was added on. So what else? They go into use of, use of force, and they also go into alternative tactics and de-escalation. So when we go into the um, what case is this? There's a case that we're going to go into. I think it's Deshaun, and also I want to get into the other Williams case. We're going to get more into detail about the use of force and alternative tactics to de-escalate. And we're going to get into a little bit more because I have a lot to share. But I don't want to bore you with it. Hold on. This is one more thing I want to show y'all. This shit is dangerous. This is under the use of force that I have to show y'all. I don't care. Y'all got to listen to this. This shit right here, I don't, I don't like it. Now, this is under the use of force. Maybe we should get into it. It says officers shall use only the amount of force that is reasonable appear necessary given the fact that the circumstances perceived by the officer at the time of the event is accomplished by legitimate law enforcement purposes. So that threat has to be aligned with law enforcement purposes and I would assume the law. The reasonableness of force will be judged from the perspective of a reasonable officer on the scene at the time of the incident. So it may say a reasonable person. It says officer. I don't like that. It should be a person, too, because that's what the law is based on, the person, not a specific class of person. We're all under the same society. So this officer, move forward. moving forward, you know, I'll be analyzing stuff. Any evaluation of reasonableness must allow for the fact that the officer are often forced to make split decisions about the moments of the force that is reasonable appear necessary in particular situations. With limited information and circumstances, there are tense, uncertain, and rapidly evolving. Given that no policies can realistically predict every possible situation an officer might encounter, officers are entrusted to use well-reasoned assertion in determining the appropriate use of force in each incident. It is also recognized that the circumstances may rise in which an officer reasonably believes that it will be impartial or ineffective to use any of the tools, weapons, and methods provided by the department, meaning that they have the distract discretion to use other tools, like their mouth, like psychological approaches, like compassion, like empathy, okay? Okay, they do have that discretion to use that. But the reasonable force has to be aligned with the encounter, the legitimate law that enforced the purpose of it as well. And when it comes to their perspective, so it's not going to be just their perspective because obviously there we're going to talk about some of the training. They do need psychological tests. They do, allegedly, to start. But I don't know the severity of it and if they're really like, you know, um, using a correct scale but we're going to learn about that in the future definitely on it okay so let's move down into alternative tactic now this is what oh this is what bothered me okay and then we're going to get into finia dukes use of force effective on arrest hold on three three oh five these are some of the scenarios but this is what bothered me right here Three three, I mean three hundred three point five carotid control hold. Do y'all fucking see this? This is why the officers think that they can grab people neck. These are people who are not healthcare officials. They have not studied A and P anatomy or physiology. I don't think that they should be authorized to do this. And then the next technique you're gonna see. Okay, 
carotid control hold. This carotid control hold is a technique designated to control the individual by temporarily um, restricting blood flow through the application of pressure to the side of the neck. You have a large blood vessel in the side of your neck. When you put your hand on the side of your neck, you're going to feel it going bump, bump, bump. That carotid is um, basically a blood vessel that pumps a lot of blood, oxygenated blood to your brain, okay? So what they try to do is cut off the blood flow so you can lose consciousness. But I don't think that's good. As a healthcare provider, that's dangerous. Loss of blood flow to the brain can cause brain damage. Even two, three minutes is dangerous. This is what they have the right to do to y'all. So the blood flow through the application of pressure to the side of the neck, due to the potential for injury the use of carotid control holds is prohibited unless deadly force is authorized so they can use it if deadly force is authorized okay the next one that i find very alarming respiratory restraints okay have you heard about this i said oh hell no a member shall not apply direct pressure to the throat and they're not supposed to windpipe or airway of a person unless deadly force is justified. And that's what they're doing when they grab you from the back and they choke you. They're not grabbing the, the side of your neck. A carotid hold, you will hold the person back of their neck. Let me just show y'all. I'm going to get myself on the screen. Uh, you will hold the person back of their neck like that. And then you can hit the back of their carotid like that because it's these two. But you never need to do this because you're literally choking their windpipe. So that's what they're saying they're not supposed to do here. Let me, let me make this a little bigger for y'all because y'all may not can see it. Due to the potential for injury and the use of carotid control. Oh, that went back to carotid. I'm sorry. So this says that um, a member shall not apply direct pressure to the throat, windpipe, or airway of a person unless deadly force is justified. And the deadly force is going to be based on kind of like the officer's perspective. And that's the big argument, guys. You know, what are the officers suspected? Because they have some form of implied immunity based on their perspective. But we already know that that's a major issue that y'all don't want to happen in this election. Because if y'all think the officers are using deadly force now, imagine when they have immunity. So a member shall not use a chokehold or any lesser contact with the throat or neck area of another in order to prevent the destruction of evidence by ingestion. So basically you can't grab their neck if they're trying to ingest drugs, okay? Or you just can't grab their neck. So this is some of the things that I wanted to highlight to you guys just to start off. Uh, I want to show you some facts behind how the Illinois police station are supposed to behave as we're going into other stories. We're going to connect it, okay? I have some other stories that we're going to do case, court cases, and we're going to be able to connect it. So, now, let's get to the nitty-gritty. We're about to get into the Duke's case, Miles and Duke's case. Please hit the like button, like and share. This is going to break down the information related to Thornton and all of the shenanigans that's going on under this lady's tenure. I mean, since she's been in there, hell has broken loose. Okay? Now, let's get to it. This is a reading that I don't think no one went into. And we're going to read it for face value. Okay? So, shout out to Miss Vanilla. Love and blessings to you. I can see how this situation is very, very traumatizing. And my heart do go out to you. Um, before we actually start this reading, it's an hour into the broadcast. We're going to take a second to hear from our sponsors. And then we're going to get to it, okay? Let's hear from, let me see what we got going on. Right. The real estate market often seems like a distant world where only an elite of experts is successful. In a time of so much uncertainty in the air and bad news, realist investing can seem intimidating. 
But today, I want to tell you that if you make the right decision today, you can enter the real estate market from the back door. Bad credit record? No credit at all. Do you dread the idea of having a home loan? Do you dream of owning investment properties? You are in the right place and right time because we have created a program which is a tax lien and deed investment online course of only 14 hours. This course is specially designed for people like you who have big dreams. You will learn at your own pace and everything from your home computer. This is your chance. Join our membership for $19.99 a year. What are you waiting for? Visit our website primetimehomebuyerbuyback.org and sign up today for course access. All right, all right. We're back and we're going to get to it right now. Okay, so I want to send love and blessings to Mr. Mia Duke and also Brian Miles. Her name is redacted in this, this filing, um, so we're going to get into it. So this is, and I'm going to say person, and that's going to be representing for Duke's from here on in, and Mr. Miles. Okay, so this is these two individuals versus Dalton, Dalton and Dalton Township. Andrew Holmes and Mayor Tiffany Henry. And there are some questions that I'm going to ask. All right, so let's get into it. So on, on or about May 26th, let's see, let me get myself off the screen so y'all can watch it like a story. You know, watch my little bobble head back there. I love you guys. Let's get to it. All right, so on or about May 26th, 2023, was administrative assistant. So this is persons. I'm going to talk about, you know who I'm talking about. Persons was an administrative assistant for the village of Dalton and Thornton Township. Miles was a law was a law enforcement officer for the village of Dalton, assigned to a specific duty to protect Mayor Hinger, um, Mayor of Dalton, and supervisor of Thornton Township, Tiffany Hinger. Okay, so this is I gotta say, dupes. I'm just gonna where all these blanks. I gotta say it because I'm not about to retract it. It's gonna make the reading hard for me. So I'm just going to say Deuce. Deuce was paid a salary by Thornton that she was paid hourly. So she was paid a salary by Thornton and she was paid hourly by Dalton. Miles was a salary law, a law enforcement officer for Dalton. Andrew Holmes was a trustee for Dalton. Prior to May 2026-2023, Hanyard advised Dalton and Thornton that she was going to be attending a conference in Las Vegas with various employees from Dalton and Thornton. Hanyard arranged for an entourage of 13 people to join her from Dalton and Thornton at the conference. This includes trustee Andrew Holmes, two members of Hanyard Security Detail, two administrative assistants of Hanyard, the village engineer, two trustees from Thornton, a photographer and some others. On, on information and belief, Thornton purchased the airline tickets for many, if not all, of Hanger. Thornton, we already know. Officer Miles, as a member of Hanger's security detail, was ordered to attend the out of state conference along with other officers on detail during the relevant time frame. Dupes was one of Hanger's assistants who also traveled to Las Vegas. On the evening of the last day of the conference, before returning to Chicago, May 2026, 2020, I mean, May 26, 2023, Dukes and Miles attended a dinner with almost all of the members of Hinger's um, entourage. After the dinner, Dukes went out with Trustee Holmes, believing she knew Holmes well and thought that of him as an uncle. He was significantly older than she was. At some point during the evening, Duke started to feel disorientated and feeling different than what one would experience with alcohol. And she advised Holmes of the same thing. Duke's recall feeling extremely lightheaded as if the ground was moving. And from the point she blacked out and did not recall anything else until the morning. This is where this story get very troubling for me because now it puts in perspective how bad it was, okay? Trusty Holmes call. Okay, the same evening, Officer Miles received a call from Holmes on his cell phone. 
Office of Miles New Trustee Homes through his deal dealing with the Board of Trustees while on their supervisor's detail, but he had no outside personal relationship with trustee homes. Okay. Holmes began describing a host of exploits from the trip, many of sexual nature, to Officer Mouse. Officer Mouse did not invite the conversation and had never been involved in any conversation with trustee homes where such issues have been raised previously. Officer Mouse believed that the trustee may have been intoxicated. At some point during the rant, trustee Holmes made reference to him engaging in sexual activity with the Dalton slash Thornton employee. Okay. And there was some suggestion that the employee may have not had the ability to consent or did not provide consent. Officer Mouse, as a law enforcement officer, began to record the call at the gesture and asked trustee Holmes to repeat himself on a number of points. Trustee Holmes then asked Officer Miles if he had an iPhone. This is how bold Holmes were, was. It doesn't make sense. The nigga had to be out of his mind. Officer Miles indicated that he did. Trustee Holmes then FaceTime Officer Miles. Officer Miles could see that Trustee Holmes had his shirt off and appeared to have exerted himself. This pissed me the fuck off. Oh, excuse my language. I got a curse on this one. Because he literally seemed like he was just out of the act of doing whatever he was doing. This monster. Do I got a picture of this monster? Do I got a picture of this monster before I continue so y'all can know who I'm talking about? I'm talking about Andrew Holmes. The devil himself. Why I don't got his ugly ass picture. He's such a monster. And I think I had just took his picture off. Let me see if I pull the picture up, y'all. Because this, y'all got to see who we talking about. This fucking animal. He going to hell and back. Okay? Now, I can see, I can see why she traumatized. I may not have it on this thing. All right, let me get back to the reading. Because I wanted to put his ugly self on the screen. But right now, let me just continue to read it so we can listen. All right. So Officer Miles and I invite the conversation. Officer Miles, as a law enforcement officer, begin to record the recording. Officer Miles indicated that he did have a phone. Trustee Holmes then FaceTime Officer Miles. This, mm. Trustee Holmes then panned the camera towards the bed where Officer Miles could see the woman who was partially undressed. The trustee then moved the camera to various private areas of the body, displaying them on the screen, and at times moving or removing articles of clothes as he transmitted in images. So this is why this nigga should be in jail. He should be in jail. It doesn't make sense. He even did, that's like online porn, what he did. Okay, that's why this shit don't make no sense, and that's why I know people covering for him in big places. That's what I feel. Officer Mouse could not tell at the stage whether the woman had consented or not, or was capable of the same, and requested that Trustee Holmes terminate terminate the transmission, the conversation. Okay, so with Officer Mouse, this was some of the questions people wanted to know: why he didn't go straight and tell. He couldn't tell was this consensual or wasn't it, you know, in the situation he was in with the, this monster that he calls a mayor, anything he do say or even if she smell it, his job was on the line, okay? This fucking monster. So this is why I, it was some delay if people wanted to ask why. Now, follow the following day, when, when the woman woke up, you know, I'm trying to just not say her name over and over. The woman woke up. She found she was in the trustee home's hotel room, fully dressed. She was embarrassed and she believed that she had blacked out and could not recall the night event. She was disorientated and could not find many of her belongings, such as her wallet. Physically, she was experiencing some discomfort, but she attributed it to her menstrual cycle. 
as she did not believe trustees would have engaged in the inappropriate activity, and she never had a romantic or physical interest in trustees. After realizing she did not have her identification, she grew concerned that she would not be permitted to travel. She contacted Officer Miles in, the same, in some distress and recounted as much as she could of the situation of her dilemma. She advised Officer Miles that uh, when she woke up and that she could not find her wallet. She was concerned she would not be able to be permitted back, travel back to Chicago without her ID. Officer Miles is assisted in trying to help her with her ID situation, but she relied, she relayed nothing more about her knowing of the actions of the trustee. So he went around helping her. And that's what people was asking, like, why did he, if he knew that happened to her, why he just do that? It's because he really couldn't tell. Like, I, I don't know, because he don't know for near, like, so I guess he's like, I'm not in my business. I'm just kind of throwing things out there. So then she reported to the trustee's conduct to the mayor and supervisor here. This is how it happened. Shortly after returning to Dalton, Officer Mouse continued to serve as the role as a member of Henry's security detail. At some point during the time, Trustee Holmes was in communication with Officer Mouse, and again, Trustee Holmes made reference to the exploitation in Las Vegas, so he came back talking shit. That monster, I know I got his picture up here. That fucking animal have the nerve to come up there talking shit. He's an animal. He's an animal. Let me see. I, I gotta go to this house. I gotta put this animal on the screen. I don't care. We're gonna get up there. Put this up the bitch. I'm sorry, y'all. I've been doing good tonight. I'm being professional. But oh oh yeah, he going up there. Oh. Yeah, let's put this up there. That's this an old picture. So y'all can know who I'm talking about and what I'm reading about. Okay? Let's get to it. So I'm going to have to stimulate your mind. So at some point during the time, Trustee Holmes was in communication with Officer Miles. And again, Trustee Holmes made reference to the exploit in, the Las, Vegas, in Las Vegas. Trustee Holmes further advised Officer Miles at the time that he had unprotected intercourse with her in Las Vegas. I, I know that's why she want to throw up. I pray God heal her soul because this motherfucker is disgusting. He's a, look at this. Look at this animal. Let me get back to the reading. I'm glad I, I just pre, I had to pre-read this so my, my reaction or my response would not be so mad. But I'm, I'm mad. Based on his prior conversations with her, Officer Mouse suspected that she was unaware the trustee had engaged in unprotected with her. He subsequently reached out to her and advised her that she would she would get that she should get medical care if she was still not feeling well and that she had that he had information he needed to provide to her. She was significantly in distress upon hearing the disinformation and she would seek medical attention. Officer Miles met her shortly, therefore, and advised her of the fact relaying to him by the trustee Holmes. He added, trustee Holmes, fuck trustee. This monster Holmes went back down there, really talking like, yeah, I got it. Yeah, I did this. Okay? And, and he's he not in jail. That's why I don't like this situation. That's why I'm going to leave it alone because people get mad because I'm, I'm, I'm mad at the FBI. They ain't doing shit. Yup. Say, I'm fucking mad. They ain't doing shit. Dalton didn't do nothing. Fucking trustee didn't do nothing. And the fucking FBI didn't do nothing. I'm going to stop cursing. I'm going to be professional. Moving forward. <sighs> so she was in severe emotional distress as a result. She needed to speak to Mayor Hanger, Supervisor Hanger. Within a very short period of time, she requested to meet with her boss, Mayor Supervisor Hanger. Officer Miles, as a member of Kenya's security detail, drove Kenya to Martin Luther King Drive, old, um, a old bank and campaign office of Kenya to meet with Dukes. Officer Miles secured the location, walking through it, and brought Kenya into the office. No one else was in attendance except Kenya, Miles, and Dukes. 
due to Vi's tenure that while in Las Vegas, she had been out of out with the trustee home the evening before they came back to Chicago. She intended she it, it initiated that she believed trustee Holmes gave her something to drink and that shortly after, therefore, she became very unstable and lost her sense of balance. She said that no recollection of anything occurred, therefore, after until she woke up in Trustee's room the next morning. She initiated that she would never have agreed to have a relationship with Trustee Holmes, and he is subsequently older than her, and she did not think of him like that, but thought of him as her uncle. She then advised him that Trustee Holmes was saying that he had unprotected intercourse with her in Las Vegas and had told as much as Officer Mao. After hearing from the family employee complaint, sorry, after hearing about the female employee complaint and factual retail, Senior asked Officer Mao what he knew about what was suggested. Officer Mal proceeded to describe what he had witnessed during the call with Trustee Holmes and advised that he had a record of recording of the portion of communication. He relied, relied, relayed all information he had to Mayor surrounding the Trustee Holmes communication and what he had told him about her. Hinger reacted shocked and immediately questioned, questioned Officer Mal as to why Trustee Holmes would call you. Officer Mal indicated that he didn't know why Trustee Holmes would call him to brag about that, other than he wanted to brag. Fania was significantly in distress following off of Mal's re incitation, recitation, I do apologize, recitation of what he witnessed. Henry didn't advise that if this information got out, Henry would be booming and all of her work she had done would be lost. She asked if this would, um, she asked if that is what she wanted to come out of this. So she asked Miss Duke, is that what you want to come out of this? It's just kind of worded funny, y'all. So, so Duke initially said she don't want to hurt Henry or ruin the project Henry had undertaken as mayor or supervisor. Henry told Duke in front of Miles that she would take care of it and handle the situation. Trust her. Shortly thereafter, Mayor Hinger called Kamal Woods. Oh, don't worry, we got more motherfuckers to read. Our, our next live is gonna talk about a, lot, a story about Kamal Woods and how the hell he got his position. Not in this live, but we got another case, okay? This is the endless cases of Dalton and Dorsey, okay? So shortly thereafter, Mayor Henry called Kamal Woods and informed and informed and briefed him. Mr. Woods and he is Mr. is Henry's boyfriend. Mr. Wood came to the meeting place and met with Fania, who relayed all of the same information to Woods. Officer Mal was not in the room with Woods and Duke spoke. She did not believe that Mayor's boyfriend was a village or town employee. And she was uncertain how he figured into Henry's plan, but she trusted Henry when Henry said that she will take care of it and thus opened up to Mr. Woods. After the meeting, Mr. Woods and Ms. Dukes, Mr. Woods, Mr. Woods approached, okay. After the meeting of Ms. Woods and Ms. Dukes, Mr. Woods approached Officer Mal. This is where intimidation started made a comment about the situation and then said something to the effect that none of this would have came up if it was not for Officer Mal. Mal was uncertain if Woods meant that in a positive way or negative way. What do y'all think he meant by that shit? How could he blame that on Officer Mal when literally you know who did this? All right. What you mean just let it out, Bree? But the cursing, I don't want to be cursed. I want to behave tonight. <laughs> All right, so how could he blame it on Officer Mal? Okay, the ramification of Duke report of what occurred. So this is the ramification. Within days of the meeting with Henry's Woods and Officer Mal, Dukes was advised that she was being placed on leave, although she did not request it, and advised that she should take some time off. She learned shortly, therefore, that the leave was not a paid leave and that someone designated 
pay an unpaid leave under the Family and Medical Leave Act. When Du subsequently asked if she could return to work, she was stonewalled for a period and then ultimately told that she could not return without a doctor's advice. It was appropriate. Dukes inquired about what sort of doctor this would require and what, what it was supposed to know what it needs to say. Inquiring were, um, inquiries were not returned and she was effectively terminated by both Thornton and Dalton. So they just say, yo, you need a note. How do, how do you need a note after being sexually assaulted? This is the monster. We're not going to forget about this story. Not at all. This is this is ridiculous. No, no one deserves it. I don't even care. So let's just move forward. So the ramification of Officer Miles for reporting what occurred. So now this is what Officer Miles went, went, after, went to. And that's why I, I can't be mad at all officers because there's some good ones out here. Within days of meeting, and, and they took him to fucking hell, okay, for, for nothing. And and some who happened allegedly. I'm just playing, y'all. I'm going to show y'all. All right, let's get to it. The ramification. I'm going to talk about it. some who happened. I told you this bitch is, is ruthless. Why, look what happened to him in the midst of this. I'm, a, I'm just going to say it's coincidence, but I'm going to say it's tenure. So, within days of meeting with Tenure, Woods and Duke Officer Miles was advised that he would be moving, removed from mayor's security detail and returned to patrol duty. So, first emotion. In, an, in the ensuing months, Officer Miles was subjected to a host of retaliatory actions for speaking truthfully and coming forward as a witness of what he believes was either sexual harassment, exploitation, or assault of, of Duke. And a hostile work environment or possible criminal conduct, criminal conduct. By way of example, after being demoted to patrol duty while the Dalton Police Station doing a report, Officer Mal noticed a member of Hinger Security Detail bringing in a leftover food from the Hinger's event earlier in the day. Something that is not that's customary. That was customary. When Officer Miles completed, I'm sorry, when Officer Miles attempted to make small talk with the officer on Mayor's detail while he was bringing in the food, Officer Miles was advised that the members of the detail were told that they cannot and shall not communicate with Miles by directive of Mayor Hinger. Here comes the black ball. By way of few, a further example, Dalton Halloween event. Now, this right here, this was suspect. I want y'all, listen, I think they were trying to hurt Officer Miles. Like, I listen to this. This shit was weird, okay? Now, he said, Ugh. hold on, where I stopped that. By way of example, y'all want me to take these ugly, uh, ugly ducking off the screen? Or y'all, we just keep it on. By way of further example, at Dalton Halloween party, Miles was told that he needed to attend by one of his supervisors, okay? It was Miles' day off, and he attended as ordered. While handing out candy and generally participating at the Halloween event, Miles and Trustee Holmes saw each other at the event. No words were exchanged, but Trustee Holmes quickly got on the phone. Very shortly thereafter, Officer Miles was told by the mayor, told the mayor would be in attendance as well, and that he needed to leave and serve as a patrol function. Mind you, this was his day off, and they called him to hand out candy. This should seem like a setup. This is crazy. Officer Miles advised his superior that he did not have his duty weapon and that he was unprepared for patrol as it was his day off and that he did not know why he had to leave. Miles was ordered to leave, which he did. Miles subsequently notified another of his superiors what what had happened and suggested that there was a coercion or effort to keep him away from Hingard and Trustee Holmes. Mal communicated this briefly by text. To me, they were trying to get him set up. Why the fuck would you tell, excuse me, tell him to go out there without his, he's not even supposed to be on duty. He's coming from a social event telling him to get in a car without a gun. You stupid. What? That's part of his tools. So do y'all think, because you know shit happened out there where they set people up. But we're going to keep on. It's not the only thing that made me think some suspect shit around me. Y'all know I always got things to the left. 
So this is how he contacted the supervisor, another supervisor. So Mal's supervisor told him that he would be contacting the department. Mal did not know if this meant his complaint would be communicated to the appropriate personnel or if it was being turned on him or somehow served as a negative employment action. So that's when he got nervous, like, I don't know what's going on here, but this is crazy. The following day, Mouse was notified by members of command staff that he was required to attend a meeting with leadership and that he needed to bring his work credentials, police badge, and work ID. Some Such a requirement customarily comes when an officer is being relieved of duty temporarily or permanently. Miles reached out to his union, and that's who I want to get involved in contact with with the union too out there, with their rules and regulations. I'll be coming with that shit. Y'all already know. So Miles reached out to the union representatives who initiate, indicated that she would inquire. Miles advised the union representatives that he indicated, initiated a filing retaliation charges on Dalton Police Department, taking adverse employment actions against him. Miles was subsequently advised by the union representative that he that she communicated his information to the department and that he would receive an oral recommendation recommendation recommend recommend I do apologize for the manner in which he communicated to his supervisor by text and that he did not need to uh, turn over his work credential. So they got mad at him for standing up for himself because he like bitch I'm not about to go out there with no tools you stupid. You got half of these people hating us, and I'm supposed to be out there with no gun? I think that was the setup, but it's more to the story. Miles was subsequently advised by his junior representative that he, that she communicated his information at the department. Um, he would, I told you the recommendation. Okay, by way of further example, Miles was thereafter subjected to criticism, unlike his peers, for various behaviors, such as not writing enough tickets, okay, or for remaining on duty roster for another municipality. Now, you know that they can work part-time for another municipality while working at one. This is something that I learned about, and it should not be a problem. But what I have learned is that these, sheriff, these deputies and chiefs of police, they play favoritism, or you do one thing they don't like, and they try to block you from other police departments, allegedly. So they try to clock and control these police officers' money, okay? And then just change their schedule, do shit. I gotta talk up for y'all police. Y'all already know. Shout out to my my secret squirrel in the background. I love you. I have mad respect for you, and I'm glad you reached out to Grace Levi and you see the genuineness in me. That you will still reach out to me to give me your grievances, knowing that I'm on these police ass like kryptonite. But I am gonna speak in honor for the good one. So Going on, this is what Officer Miles had to go through. Most recently, on January 1st, 2024, Miles was involved in an incident where the suspect collided with Miles' police vehicle during a call, call arrest causing, and this says call arrest, not car arrest. It says during a call arrest causing Miles significant injury. All I'm going to say is voodoo. I don't care if y'all believe me or not. This bitch. I'm gonna blame her for the for the for the wild shit. That's just my opinion, and I'm gonna shut up. So now Mouse is injured, okay? Mouse has significant pain in his neck and back and was taken to the emergency room where he was placed on injury off duty. Injured off duty. So I O D I O D leave. The emergency room indicated that Mouse could not return to work for three days. Three days, okay? In the interim, Miles made an appointment with his primary care physician, which was to take place on January 8th. So he was supposed to, the emergency room gave him to the 4th, and he couldn't get an appointment to the 8th. So on January 4th, Miles was contacted by the superior and told he needed to be reported to work right now in one hour. Officers Miles wrote back to his superior and advised him that he was on IOD leave and that further uh, future January 4th was his regular day off. So this January 4th, he's supposed to be off. Um, and he asked his superior if he was aware of these facts and whether he still wanted Mouse to return to work. Mouse superior said yes. Mouse reported to work as the designated time 
even though he was in significant pain, pain, and he was on pain medicine, and it was his day off. You see what I'm saying? They made him come in there, and he was on pain medicine. Okay, and they knew this. Impaired, and that's not nothing to office the mouth. Some his superior advised him that he could sit at the desk and perform light duty. It is evident that it was no emergency or circumstances requiring Miles to be at work or return immediately. After some time to sit in the chair, Miles found himself in significant pain. The chief of police asked him, how are you doing today, buddy? How are you doing, Miles? And Miles advised him, I'm not doing well. The chief responded, oh, you're fine. He'll be all right, while making a dismissive gesture. As more time passed, the pain increased and to the point that Miles had to be taken from the station to the emergency room as a result of the pain. Miles was advised by the medical profession that at the hospital not to return to the knife. Like, yo, go to the doctor. You know me. I'll be like, yo, why you went back to work? You just love to work. And then he, in the back of his head, he like, I got to. I'm about to lose my damn job. This is the pressure that he, they have him on. And I'm telling you, car accidents ain't no fucking joke. You get bulging discs, all types of shit. Like, you have to do a whole complete lifestyle change. You got to go to some therapy. I'm keeping it real because from the medical perspective, taking care of them and myself having a bulging disc from car accidents. That shit ain't no joke. You didn't even get this man a week. Not even a week. Three days. And this was an accident on a job. And mind you, what you hear us talking about, they did not even make a doctor's appointment for him to go to the doctor before they told him to come back. But we're going to keep on listening. So, Miles was advised by the medical professionals at the hospital not to return to work until January the 9th. On January 8th, Miles saw his primary care physician who examined Miles and indicated that Miles could not return to work until January 23rd in 2024 and also referred Miles to a neurologist not just a chiropractor let's break this down a little bit medically he has some nerve damage when they tell you to go to neuro neurologist that means that you may have a severed nerve you may have um you know like t tingling numbness or sometimes these severed nerves could cause you to stop walking have sciatica problems and eventually sometimes it could lead to seizures it's not a joke this shit ain't no joke I had a young boy, 17 years old, who came in, and I have to tell you a little quick story. He basically had a car accident two days prior. Allegedly, they was on Atlanta Highway. Somebody shot at this dude. He was 18 years old, and he didn't tell his mother. He crashed into, like, a tree. No, she knew about it. He crashed into, like, a tree on the side of the road. Didn't go to the hospital. He hit his head. Yo, that day before, the day he got admitted, his brother literally found him sitting on the bed dazed bloody okay what had happened he ended up getting up walking about to make his breakfast i'm telling you as a nurse my nursing experience this is how serious this shit is when they tell you to see a neurologist and he got up and had a seizure and fell into the glass inside of his room and then didn't even fucking know it and he was in the house by himself and when his brother ended up coming in, he saw the broken glass in the room and he saw his brother just standing and sitting there in a daze. So I don't know if he was having a second round of seizure. This is from a head concussion car accident that wasn't treated. No joke. So I just have to tell you the severity of it because I don't think Officer Miles was actually faking the funk. And even sitting down for long periods of time, that could exacerbate um, pain. Pain, okay? So I just had to share that story, how serious it is, guys. I have to drive safe. Let's move forward. So the same day, January 8th, Miles provided his superior with the letter, stating the same of the position. He said, here, this is what it is. He said, I can't come back towards the 28th. Just leave me alone. You On January 9th, approximately 516, Miles was advised that he had his command staff. You have an appointment at the company doctor tomorrow at 10 a.m. So by the end of the dead day, he's like, oh, no, you want to see our doctors because you try to be off of work, I guess. Miles was provided the address and told him verbally that uh, if he did not, it was told verbally, if he did not go to the appointment, it would be very, very bad for him. That is a threat. 
okay? They're threatening this man to go to their doctor. Still in pain, Miles complied. Now, this is how they protect Miles. See, you know, some health care providers are good. So still in pain, Miles complied and went to the appointment made for him by his superiors the next day. Miles was sent home by the clinic with a letter stating that they could not see him based on the notes provided by the primary care provider because that clinic, whatever was in that primary care provider notes was above their practice. Meaning once they, they gave him a consult for a neurologist, that's a fucking problem. That is close to having spinal injuries possibly or brain injuries. It's not a joke. So this is where the clinic like baby uh, is already a console out. This is what I'm seeing from this. And we can't do nothing because we just basic. So both um, Deuce and Miles um, timely filed complaints against defendant Dalton, Thornton, and Hanger with the Illinois Department of Human Rights and timely notified the department of their intent to opt out of the department process and pursue their claims before this court. So they were supposed to go through the process, you know, procedures to, um, even though they, it was a lot of time that went by and they never actually um, investigated Ms. Duke's claims. So that time was just going by and that was part of their procedures of what they were supposed to do under someone given alleg um, allegations against um, people such as a trustee. There's supposed to be some type of rules of regulation or policies, and it seems to not. So we're going to get into the count. We're in our last seven pages, and then we're going to get into our next case. I told y'all I'm going to break this down. People say, why you want to do AI? Because it's a lot of reading, and y'all asses won't read it, but I'm here for it, okay? So since I started off just reading the, and we did something funny, I got the energy for it. Okay, so let's get to it. Y'all like my reading style, baby? Let me stop. Let's get to it. Let's finish. We're going to get to the counts now. Take my little funky head off of here so y'all can focus in. So here goes the count. So the first count is going to be highlighting, I believe, in this Duke's count against Thornton and Dalton Township. And this is violation of Illinois' human rights. And this is all important to the paragraphs that we just read to you from 1 to 85 here, okay? Um, let me take them off the screen so you can see see the document if y'all want to take a break from seeing that. All right, so this is the Human the Violation of Illinois Human Rights Act, and this is related to Ms. Duke. So this is highlighting the acts of um, sexual harassment, um, harassment. These are the two bases of this count. And that further provides additional civil rights violation under the Article 2455A is the civil rights violations for persons or persons retaliation. So this is the, the next uh, foundational law that they're using to satisfy their first claim for misdues, okay? So sexual harassment, harassment, as well as retaliation by the firing her. So as a result of the provided notice of the sexual harassment, assault, retaliation, she was experienced, she was experienced, she has suffered a loss of her employee employment and subsequently damage, including mental anguish in violation of the Illinois Human Rights Act, for which plaintiff Duke's request payback pay. She went back pay from pay, punitive damage, attorney fees, prejudice. Oh my God, prejudgment ish in interest. I'm sorry, she going for blood. Y'all see how I got a little tongue tied. She wanted all expense and cost and any of all the future relief permitted by law. She going by for blood. I can't be mad at her, but look who's suffering though. Look who's suffering. It is Thornton and Dalton. Now, Thornton, they're coming after your bank. These lawsuits are coming now on Thornton. This is why we're highlighting all the most of all the other lawsuits that I high, highlighted was in Dalton. Now, here we go. She brought her shit over here. Well, it's hitting both of them. They're going to have to split this. So now it's assault and battery. This is count two. Now, this is against Holmes. And the reason why it's going to be falling under the jurisdiction of I would believe Thornton Township is because he is an employee there, just like they have the public service, service like police, that when they get sued, 
is going to fall under their employee. So this is how he is being protected. He, she's not totally going directly after him, but at, after him under his capacity. So it's assault and battery. This is count two. Trustee Holmes initially, intentionally contact or touch the body of plaintiff unwanted fashion without plaintiff dukes console or knowledge. Um, Trustee Holmes behavior caused plaintiff reasonable apprehensions of any intimate offense, offensive contact which ultimately occurred. As a result, plaintiff dukes has suffered substantially physically and emotional harm as a result of the Trustee Holmes action. I don't like the way that was written up. Uh, I think that they should add more detail what the assault battery led to. As far as like they're, they're, what they're trying to like mental a anguish and stuff, they have to show a little bit more like, you know, they're going to talk about loss of employment, but also, you know, um, more examples of, you know, how she was blackballed, you know, how she, you know, fear for her safety, you know, things like that. I think they should just should go in more detail. That that's just all I'm saying. To make it juicier. Okay. So several remedies for non consensual dissemination of private sexual image. This way this nigga should be going to federal jail. Homes need to go to jail. You know somebody out here well I'm not in Atlanta right now, but somebody in Atlanta called um if you ever heard of him his name was called, um, he used to run this cult called Carbonation. He used to run on the internet, on YouTube. We're not going to get into him. But basically, he ended up in jail in Fulton County. I think in Fulton County, too. That nigga in the worst jail for sexual assault. One of his cult members um, recording it, showing it on um, the internet. And he got some time for that shit. That's why I don't understand why, why the fuck is home still walking around. That's why I be feeling some type of way, y'all. Making me lose hope in the system. Shit, I be trying. Fuck around, find out. So now, this is what I think he should be going to jail for, but this is what she has to sue for. So Clayton is deuce, reinstate, and incorporate allegations that we talked about from 1 to 85. At all relevant times, there was an effect in the Illinois and civil remedy for non-consensual dissemination of private sexual image. So that's the law. So they go into the law a little bit about here the particular individual that did not consent to the dissemination of image was private sexual image. The depiction in, um, individual was, was um, identifiable. Trustee Holmes violated the PSIA when he transmitted the private sexual um, images to Officer Mal. Dukes never consented to the transmission and said images was unidentifiable to Officer Miles in the transmission. Was identifiable, was identifiable to Officer Miles in the transmission. So this is how they went into it. So remedies and action under the law, economic, non-economic damage, proximal cause by the defendant. Uh, shoot, statutory damage not to exceed $10,000 against each defendant found liable for their actions. Um, so they put some details. You see how you put it in there? So we can at least get $10,000 off of this claim right here. You see why they put different counts? Because this is how you get things built up and then you got to give a remedy of what you want from it. So they want a statutory da damages, the amount equal to the monetary gains made by the defendants from disseminating the private sexual images. I don't think he made any money from it. Punitive damage, yes, she could probably get that. And any action under the act, the court may award a prevailing plaintiff, reasonable attorney fees and costs, and additional relief, including injunctive relief. So there's a lot of grounds for her to receive more funding, money, on behalf of this. So next, the next count is violation of Illinois Human Rights Acts related to mouths. Okay, Officer Miles, how they tried to intimidate him. Okay, so I was just kind of looking. I got quiet because it says the act stated in the re re relevant part. So I guess they were just referring to the sexual harassment um, claims that he was making and which caused him to his human rights to be violated. I'm trying to understand why this was under there because I know he didn't get 
sexual harassment. But this is probably the foundations of his claim for the most part. The act further provides that retaliation happened to him. Now, this makes sense. So the first part was basically the foundations of what got him to be retaliated on and human rights to be violated. Again, you're going to see the same concept that's been going on throughout all of these cases, which is conspiracy is going to come up. Okay, but here they highlight retaliation is one of the issues. Retaliation against a person because he or she has opposed that which uh, he or she has reasonable and in good faith believed to be unlawful discrimination. Okay, also um, abiding and abating coercion, aiding, abating, compelling. So they're they're trying they're trying. This is where they're building up the the talk about um, conspiracy because it's going to come up next. Okay, so as a result of Mal's willfulness to serve as a witness of sexual assault, retaliation, um, harassment, retaliate, retaliation has witnessed both in Las Vegas and in Dalton. Miles has been demoted, passed over for promotion, subjected to reprimands that he did not, that he should not have had, called in from IOD leave when he was in pain, tried to kill my man, and call in on days off purely to harass him in violation of the Illinois Human Rights Act. Literally disrespectful. So what Officer Malzah actually for respectively request this honorable court grants placing back pay, front pay, pure for the damage, attorney fees, um, prejudgment interest. He's going from blood to interest and costs under the Illinois Human Rights Act granted. Back pay, front pay, punitive damage, attorney fees. Okay, I, I to see that's where the dyslexia kicked in. My eyes went back up to that. Like, whoop, let me go back down. Sorry, y'all. Back pay, front pay, punitive damage, attorney fees, um, prejudgment interest, expenses, costs, and statutory damages under the Private Sexual Image Act. Because he put him in. I oh, damn. How he gonna wait make money off of that? Like his image was under there. And actual punitive damage for assault and battery, and grant both plaintiff and in all further relief. I, I wonder how he he trying to fall under that. But if they can make it happen, they can make it happen. Shit. But maybe because he was traumatized, sending him sexual images. He's like, nigga, I'm traumatized from the shit too. Shit. So that is the last. Um, that I can't say this is the last update. I'm going, this is the original filing guide. Okay. And this is a detailed breakdown of what happened out there in Las Vegas. Um, I think it was good for us to go over because some people had different perspectives. Just, you know, just clarify from what they're filing, what was their perspective. And that made sense to me why Officer Miles didn't right off the bat tell somebody in Vegas because it was questioned about like okay did this really happen did she know what the hell going on around here you see what i'm saying so we're gonna have to send some love and support to officer mouth and everything that he's going through because there are some good officers outside of these buckets right here this one this one these fake officers you know what i'm saying it's, it's some good ones out there and who else? Who else I got up here? These right here. Y'all remember I did a whole lot about the history of Dalton, even before Dalton. I mean, sorry, even before tenure that this corruption has been going on for a while. These are some of the officers. And this is what led to the death of Miss Alexis Wilson. And and the tragedy that Miss Cara has to go through. Shout out to them again. Y'all yeah, do remember we do have a petition to sign. We're trying to get, I think, I'm going to look to see where we're at. Hopefully we pass 200. If we're not past 200, please, y'all, check the petition out. All we're trying to do is get the Alexis Justice Center um, named officially because we already named the shit, okay? In my head, that's the name of it. But we need to make sure we can present to the trustees a good petition so they can move forward. And I don't even think that we should actually have to have a trust to have a petition because they should just do this. They know it's messed up. They know what happened to our baby girl is fucked up. Excuse my language, OK? 
okay? I'm a mama. And so before we get into our last, our next case, yep, we're going to talk a little bit real quick, and I'm going to tell y'all why I didn't go live. And then we're going to get into our next case that highlights Mr. Thrash. And Mr. Thrash is going to be going against Tiffany Hanger and Keith Friedman. And this has to do with the school board. So we got some good stuff to go over because we're going to just flash back to when Hanger, um, that's why I look a little sleepy, y'all, today. I had a rough night, okay? So this is my little interlude so y'all can find out what's happening with Grace Levi. So last night when I got off the phone with y'all, 